You're listening to the Scaling Culture Podcast, where we sit down with thought leaders who share their experiences building incredible workplace cultures. Before diving into today's episode, we want to welcome everyone to 2022, and we're very excited to kick off this year with some news. Our team has worked hard for many, many months behind the scenes, putting together the best content on how to build and sustain a high-performing, resilient team. And our six-hour online course, Scale and Culture Masterclass, is now available for all leaders to dive in. This is the ultimate online course to build and sustain a resilient, high-performing team with eight modules on all things culture. As a listener of this podcast, you likely know by now that our host, Ron, constantly pushes guests to share the how-to behind culture transformations. So as you've come to expect from Ron, the masterclass is full of actionable takeaways you can put into practice in your organization right away. Whether you're a frontline leader, CEO, or running a startup and about to make your first hire. To purchase a course or learn more, go to scalingculture.org. Now, on to the show. Our guest today is Badia Rebel. Bolido Abud, Chief People Officer at Krispy Kreme. Badia offers three decades of extraordinary success in a series of high-level roles at top-tier companies that include Krispy Kreme, Byersdorf, Siemens, Bedeck, Nestle, and Procter & Gamble. At Krispy Kreme, Badia's main focus is to build the human resources strategy for the region from the ground up for this food and beverage company, including an expansion roadmap and a culture vision for the region. Prior to Krispy Kreme, Badia achieved over two decades of experience driving positive outcomes across executive HR leadership, personnel development, HR technologies, change management, and employee relations. In this episode of Scaling Culture, Ron and Badia discuss why it's harder to change culture than to create it, how to effectively create and implement change in the workplace environment, how to develop a results-driven mindset, and the power of language and humbleness to be able to speak to employees' hearts. Enjoy the show. Welcome to another episode of the Scaling Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ron Lovett, and today, all the way from Mexico City, we have Badia Worthington. Badia, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Yeah, me too. One, uh, you're a first guest from Mexico, which is exciting. Um, mm. And two, huge fan of the brand, Krispy Kreme. <laughs> like I'm a, right? Who this isn't? Is- except the diabetics, which I'm really sorry for Ooh. them. But everybody else seems to love them. <laughs> They're excellent. And so, look, one, uh, you know, I've, that's probably a tough place to have Krispy, Krispy Kreme because it's so hot down there. So it probably melts very quickly or maybe you have a different formula. I'm not sure. But in Canada, it stays it stays frozen for quite a while. You can walk around all day with it. It stays. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. <laughs> okay. We have a, quite a challenge in the in the hot areas like Cancun and yeah. all those exactly because of that. So what we have, it, the, the formula is the same. It's just that we make sure that the environment in the shop it nice and actually cold. makes sure it's, yeah, exa- it's not cold enough for the for the glaze not to go you know mm. all over the place muy frío eh, suficientemente frío ah just sufficiently cold yeah ah not bad eh? not bad yeah not bad not bad we can switch to spanish whenever you want huh? i might i'll throw the odd word in and just, just okay see for imagine. our latino okay. for our latino audience there we okay go. thank you absolutely okay <laughs> uh so Let's look. I want to start because you, as we just discussed, you just landed at Krispy Kreme as chief people officer not too long ago. But tell us your we introduced you before the show started, but just, just give us the headlines, Badia. Tell us your story. You, you, you've you transitioned from a few different industries to land in a very unique one. Tell us more about that, your journey. Sure. Um, I studied in Canada. I studied in Vancouver. Wow. And I decided to study psychology because it was a subject I really liked in high school. I really didn't know what, what to study. So there, there I was. When I finished my degree and came back to Mexico, um, I ended up in Procter & Gamble. And one thing that Procter & Gamble has is they know where you're going to be successful. And they said that I should be in HR. That's how I landed in HR. Simple as that. Do you, sorry, but did you know how they knew that? Was it, wow, you're good energy, good with people. How do they know? Do you know today how they discovered that or figured that out? Well, yeah, I was in recruiting after a while, so I better know. And it is what, um, when you interview Procter & Gamble, what they tend to have is, uh, you know, they hire people from university, you know, they entry level. And what they look for is exactly on those skills that you have developed throughout school, even if it's high school, you know, and in your experience, uh, broad experience, and obviously your tendencies and likes. So it's a mix between them and you can identify, you know, 
people oriented people. You can identify people who are very structured in terms of, and also their background and, and, and careers um, play a role uh, that go into finance or marketing. You have those creative people and the engineers. So, and, and you look for an, um, a holistic personality. Um, things that work out when you go there is talking about, oh, I was, you know, the president of the graduation committee. I was in the student union. I was in the student council. I was captain of the hockey team. And uh, you know, so that's what makes a round person, because at the end of the day, um, the skills, you know, it, you, you can be taught skills. You cannot be taught attitude and, and that personality. And if you don't have that, then you're not successful in many areas and in different. There's, there's always a company for you, but not necessarily for Procter. So they were very good at knowing where I was going to be successful. I fell in love with HR have been in all the areas. Um, and um, I was there for 13 years. Then I was in, in the same consumer goods area for a while. Then I went into technology, ended up in startups, which I ended up there because I thought I had done my fair share of multinationals and I wanted to leave a legacy. And if my kids were not going to pay attention to me, maybe somebody else would. So I decided to go to a startup and leave my mark there. So um, I did. And amazing, it's, it's addictive, that sector nowadays. What was your um, mark? What, does, what was the mark that you left? Actually, I created the, 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 the function of HR in the two startups that I had been in. Um, they didn't have anything but payroll and being you know, outsourced. So I created everything. I created the strategy of each area. I created the team. I created for the company, the business um, the HR business part of it, which is how the, does the area of people actually help to reach those targets and those um, objectives that you have as a startup, you know, what they call the massive transformation purpose is how does people play a role in that. So I made sure I left the processes, which are the basics and fundamentals. And then from then on, all the extra stuff, which is now considered, you know, the business partner part of it. So uh, that's, that's what I did. Wow. And I, I fell in love with it. And I ended up in Krispy Kreme because um, they knocked on my door and they were in a very interesting position. Um, Krispy Kreme, back in the day, um, was like a franchise in each country or managed individually. And right. it's been a few years now that in the U.S., Krispy Kreme, the, the, the brand, has started to buy those franchises. So um, they had by just the done that in yeah, by the back. So right now, the U.S. has uh, the UK, Australia, and they had just bought Mexico in November 2019. And they knocked on my door just around that time. And I started in July 2020. And that's how I ended up here. So I, I am a pandemic girl um, that just arrived with it. And what attracted was, and that's why it, change management right now is so uh, such a hot topic for me, because they were transitioning. It was a carve out, if you may. So they were bought, but it's a carve out because we were part of a holding. Krispy Kreme was part of a holding in Mexico and the type of culture they had, very different to what Krispy Kreme wants to implement and do. I'm talking really like water and oil. It was, it's yin yang, completely different. Mm -hmm. Because so of the leadership at Krispy Kreme? Like what, what, what's driving that? It's got to be different leaders at that business. Say, look, I, Obviously. I, right, yeah. Obviously, it's different leaders and different perspective and what they want to do with the brand. Um, I was not in the holding, so I honestly do not know the, you know, the, the insights of it. But from what I've seen of the people that are here from there, it's a very, let's call it very um, old fashioned, very traditional mm -hmm. type of, of, of culture, very hierarchical. Uh, very, you know, up down. That's how things work. And you, they tell you what to do and you do, you don't question. Command and, control. and, and Krispy Kreme wants to do something completely different. So it's, it's, it's fun. It's new. It's fresh. And more than saying culture, you know, it's, oh, it's very U S or it's very German or it's very, no, no, it's very humane. And I mm. just fell in love with it. Love that. But, yeah. But, uh, just a, question and then i want to dive into the Krispy cream uh, stuff but for you what was your kind of aha moment of people and culture and there's a different way to do this than the old command and control as you just described you know because a chief people officer in most cases 
you know, has to be great with people, enjoy people and really care about an individual versus typically just the performance of trans, you know, the transaction of a performance of an individual at work. It's more about the entire organization. How does people connect to goals? Like you talked about, what was your aha moment to drive you into like, ah, I'm passionate about that. When I started in Procter, this is in last century. Okay. Gay, that shows more or less my age, but anyway. We'll, we'll, we'll beat that out. Don't you worry when, about that. We'll when, beat that right it, out. it was the end of the century. It was just the end of it. But when I started working there, um, I remember, as I was telling you, there's a very strict process in, 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 in Procter, right? And when I, they hired me and I met my boss, my boss did not interview me, which is unusual. But he was in the training. When he came and he met me, his first, after meeting me and we talked, his first thing he said to me was, how on earth did they hire you? And I, was, I, I felt terrible. I'm like, I'm 25 and they're telling me that. I'm like, what did I do? And I'm like, why? What, what did I do? Like, because you're not the typical TNG style. Okay. And I remember his words, and that was a long time ago. And he said, do not let them proctorize you. Don't let oh, wow. them change that. I'm like, okay, the essence, he said, you know, don't, don't let that essence. And that's when I realized that my personality is kind of, it's different than most. And that's what I love. I, I love to be, um, to stand out. I'm always searching and reapplying and looking what's out there, making people uncomfortable, mm. uncomfortable in a sense of questioning the, the status quo, not uncomfortable, you know, you know, yeah. leave it, you know, in the, in the wrong way. Um, so it's, it's what's happening. Hey, why don't we do that? Oh, because we've always done it this way. Yeah, but oh, that doesn't mean we have to do it that way. Why, why cannot we evolve? And I bring always the examples of Kodak, for example. You know, um, It was an engineer in 1974 in Kodak who created the first digital camera. And what did they tell him? Shush, don't say anything. Why? Because they manage a business called Razor and Blades. And that strategy means that we sell the razors really ex really um, cheap, but all, all, um, all the blades really expensive. So that's their mentality was cheap cameras, but the development and the film was really thin. And they were top of the, you know, they were the leaders, but they didn't want to evolve. And what happened? Well, my kids don't know Kodak. <laughs> that, that's what happened, you know? Right. And, and that's what I mean. I'm like, you have to, and once you develop, you know, evolve, evolve again and question it. So I'm always causing a stir, rocking the boat. And mm. I'm always trying to find a way for people to feel, you know, that things are happening. And, and that's, it happened that far back. That's, that's incredible. Um, which is probably a great use of your energy and time with this new transformational job that you're doing. Cause it sounds like it is quite transformational. It was old command and control, new leadership want to make some changes. So let's dive into that because the, change management around a new culture, culture transformation, from my experience is divisive. It's like politics and religion. Some people say, I didn't sign up for that. So I'm leaving and others like, finally, it's here. Is that what you're experiencing? What are, what are the highs and lows and some of the challenges of, of, of trying to implement a, a culture transformation? What I found is that after having created culture, which is in a start of what you do, I found out that it's harder to change culture than to create it. I've had that. Um, and what I found is exactly what you say, and then some in the middle. So yes, you have those who are like, nope, this is not for me. And I admire those people who have made the decision to say, this is not for me. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. I admire that. And I've had people who are like, oh, thank God, this is, my, you know, this is what we're looking for. You know, I was feeling really low when I was just about to quit. Thank you. But then you have the people who you have to convince. Mm. And what I call them is, you guys, you, you're, you're on the carriage, you know, you, you're, you're in the wagon, you're sitting there. And that's great because you're going where the company's going. But I don't want you up there. I want you pulling the carriage with me. Because there's so many people up there saying, yeah, let's see where it goes. Watch it's it. really heavy. It's really heavy. So I really need you guys to come down and pull with me because those that are pulling are convinced. There's three types of people that I find. People who are convinced um, politically, i.e. they will tell you, yeah, yeah, let's, let's, let's do that. Yeah, yeah. Those are who are convinced mentally or like that makes sense. 
logically. Not in the but it makes sense. And then you have the people who are convinced in the heart. Those will say, hey, I'm pulling with you, man. Let's go. I don't have many of those. I have a lot of, 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 of logical thing. It makes sense. But they're still sitting on the carriage. <laughs> Um, and those who didn't and were political, either they're out or we're, you're, we're coaching them out. So I'm curious, did it start with that transparent conversation? Hey, everybody, we're heading on this journey. I think there's probably going to be three three categories. Some of you are going to want to leave. Was, was, was that message there or not? Did you just see it when you got going? The first part, yeah, not the second. So, yes, I told them, you know, this is where we're heading. This is where we're going. This is the new, and they knew that it was new because they had actually changed, you know, they, they were not the holding anymore. They were not Christy Groom. So they knew it, it was nothing, you know, a secret there. Um, and there was a new culture and new processes, blah, blah, blah. So they knew that. And we came and we communicated that. And this is where we're going. And then we've done training, specific trainings under the circumstances for they understand the culture and what we're doing and what we're looking for, what's acceptable, what's not. And but we didn't say that there's three types of people. Which one are you, ma'am? No, no, we didn't reach that point. I, I thought that would be a little too candid. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, I'm curious, you know, is there is there a time frame? Do you, do you once you go through it, those who, because you want the heart to be in it at some point, once they've said, oh, you know, okay, logically, this makes sense. I'm enjoying it. Now my heart's in it. Maybe that's going to come later. But as we all kind of know if someone can't get there they become cancerous and a detractor and so is there a from your experience is this going to happen in three six months where we sit down and say look ron this just you know are you happy if not let's find you a new home this isn't this isn't right like at what point do you do you make the decision for someone because it's so misaligned because at some point if you wait too long it actually can be cancerous to the culture absolutely um for me, it's you either coach them up or you coach them out. And when do you find out about that? Um, it, it's hard to put a time frame on it. Um, some people are doing their best trying to accommodate to the new culture. But they're, they're trying it. And so they're a little camouflage because they're going with the flow. But then finally, what they realize is this is not for me or this is not what I, And that's when, you know, things start going belly up. And you make those decisions. So it's really hard to put a time frame on it. But right. usually, usually in, in about, and I would say stretching maybe a year because it, it has to create culture, it takes three to five years. It's not a plug and play, unfortunately. It's not the new system. It's not, you know, it's not um, SAP. Now it's Oracle. No, it's, it's not that simple. I wish, but it's not. So it's different time frames for everybody. But what I try to do or what we're trying to do is to make sure that the man, you know, our leaders are looking into that to say, you know, he's, he's just not with it. Um, so we coach them out and we coach them out in a good way. Is we've had chats with them saying, you know, what is it? What is it? I feel that you're uncomfortable. I feel you don't like this. I, you know, what is it? Is it am I perceiving it wrong? Because also, you know, perception is. Uh, can be different to what you're trying to project as a, as an employee. So we try to do very customized and obviously case by case. I think that makes sense. Cause it isn't one blanket. It wasn't, it isn't one mm-hmm. time it's customized. I like what you say case by case, because it's, it's going to vary by individual, you know, Absolutely. by how long they've been there, their beliefs and, and whatnot, and where they are in, in buying into the logic or where there are in their heart getting involved in the process. Um, I, I want to go back to what you said earlier is something you said, look, I like to, you know, stir things up and make people uncomfortable. How does that look? How do, what's your strategy? What are those conversations? What are you pushing at to make people and leaders uncomfortable? Oh, it depends obviously on the subject. Um, but for example, in Mexico, you have um, by law, obviously so many holidays, depends on how long you've been in a company. Just, just for the record, I thought you said bailar, which is dancing, but you said by law. By law, yeah, by law. <laughs> I'm joking. That was a joke. That yes, word. we have, um, we have, and, and, and they're very, they're not many, you know, it's six days a year in the first year you're here until you're three years in the company. So anyway, and that's always a big, big issue when you change um, companies, because in, if you change companies, it's not that because I've been working for so many years in the industry or, you know, 
then I'm allowed that many. No, it's you start all over again. So people like me who have been working for over 20 years, going to a company and getting again six days a year, you're like, you have to be kidding me. Like, you know, I'm, no, I'm you know, like you. And there's companies who have made different, you know, changes like, oh, well, you know, we started 15 or et cetera, but nothing more than that. And what I found in the startups, and especially with the new generations, and, with, and, and, and I love that about them, is they're there to create and to have experiences. And that's what they like. They want to, you know, um, that's what makes them grow. And I'm a big fan of flexible benefits, if you may, which is, and I do not believe in the words millennial and boomers. And I'm like, no, you there's a tendency, but at the end of the day, I am going to be, and I, I, you can quote me on this, I will be a millennial in two years because my daughter will be gone to university and therefore my husband and I, newlywed, we will be doing what millennials like to do, which is every so often go off. So again, it depends what you, you know, that, that definition, I don't like to put people in those kind of, of, of stereotypes. So my point here was, I, I thought, you know, people depends on what they are doing in their life at the moment in time, they require different benefits. They require different things. And one of the things that most people obviously cherish is time with their family. Occasions are not, but no, it's, it's time with the family. So I had been her you know, research and I'm always looking around what's happening. And I found out about the concept of unlimited holidays, unlimited vacations. And I just, threw it in the committee one day and I'm like, well, what about doing this, guys? Obviously, everybody was like, oh, what are you talking about, people? I'm like, do you actually, obviously, I've done my homework of, of research. So I'm like, do you actually believe somebody has the money to go on a six month holiday? I'm like, well, no. And do you think we hire people who are so irresponsible that will be willing to drop it all off to go on a two month holiday? Um, no. I'm like, I'm doing, so I started asking them, which I knew were the questions that I would be asking and would be. And so when you start giving them data, facts, figures, uh, a very good um, leader I had once, he said, nobody can refute data. Don't bring urban legends, just bring data. And it's true. So I brought the data. And in Krispy Kreme, we have unlimited holidays in Mexico. Yeah, great. And <clears throat> good for you to push that. And, and you're right. It was you know, so, so sparking uncomfortable conversations are through very direct questions, right? And kind of demanding answers and asking logical questions, right? And you have to be ready to, you know, you have to be mentalized. Like the first thing they'll say is like, you're crazy, no way. And it's going to take time, but you have to be ready with what typically is their concern. Just to make sure it's called, um, it, it's a sales strategy and it's managing, you know, um, objections. So if you're ready with what they're going to ask you. Yeah. You know, so I was in the, <clears throat> uh, my previous business was private security. So physical guards uh -huh. and old space command and control. And in 2014, I, I also was in that same position and I researched and there was a, um, a guy named Cameron Harold who wrote a book about double, double. And he said five weeks and I was stuck between five weeks and unlimited. And I landed on unlimited because five weeks, to me, someone would still take five weeks and then someone still had to track it. And someone, like, I was just like, this is a bunch of noise. So we went to unlimited. And so I announced it quarterly and I had a salesperson at the time said, well, because, you know, I, I said, look, we want to be results driven. If we're results driven, then who cares about the clock? And in this case, someone said, well, are you telling me if my sales targets are 2 million for the quarter and I hit it in the first two months, I can take the last month off? I said, absolutely you can. I said, now, you know, we may want to adjust if it was that simple for you. This is high performance. We are looking for people to upgrade by 15% all the time. And so we may want to adjust that target if, that, if that's what you like to do. But in this scenario, yes, take a month off. So it was very interesting. It was, and I had big debates. I talked about this exact story in the debate I had with a neighbor in, in the book I wrote, Outrageous Empowerment. And I, um, so I was kind of smiling. You were bringing me back to that moment. And we continue my company Vita living today as mm -hmm. I'm on vacation. It's performance based. So I'm really glad to hear that. And, and good for you to have the courage to land somewhere and not, you know, not wait till you're overly comfortable. I'm assuming your relations weren't that strong when you, when, you know, when you came in and had this conversation. So good on you to stir things up. It, it, it created a, 
a branding of who and what kind of things will they be re ready to expect from me on the time to come, you know, uh, because that's, that's what it is. It's, 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 it's bringing the, the new and the different um, to the old folkies that I work with. <laughs> right, right. And so let's talk about this concept that we spoke about earlier, which I thought was really interesting. And I need to bring up the name again, which is you guys have Wirecky. Yeah. Am I saying that right? Wirecky? Yeah, Wirecky. It's a new methodology. In, and there's, there's uh, the, the author created it, and he might hate me for this because I don't remember his name. But I've read the book, and you can find it on Amazon. Um, it's called what was the book called again? Wirecky. <laughs> Wirecky. Okay, great. Wirecky. And it talks about, it, it's like the web. It's, it talks about wires, you know? It's how wire, you know, they interact, you interact. It's it's a let's call it, it's a new way of calling multifunctional work, and we've all done it. The difference here is that it doesn't stop at a project or at a team; it goes throughout the company. You will always have your org charts in which you know there's a CEO and the because you need that visual structure for other purposes like compensation and maybe um, reviews, and et cetera. But when it comes to work, what it focuses on is getting rid of that and being, if I could, I can't, but if you have to you know, visually see it, instead of having a pyramid-like, it's more like an organism. You have a, a, a center and then you know, people around and they're, they're talking to each other. So it's a wire key. It's, it's like a cell, you're all over the place. And what it means is, you might take the lead in a moment in a process because that's the part that you need to step in for. So you're all, all of you are accountable for the results. You all act like owners, like entrepreneurs, like startups. You are all part of it. At, and it's not like, oh, that's not mine. I don't do that. That's, that's from, you know, that, that's fine. No, no, no. It's, it's how can I help? Because we need to focus on that end result. And it goes beyond, oh, we're all in the vision and the mission. No, it's beyond that. It's actually being accountable and taking the lead in those moments. And that's really hard to implement because people look at their little, you know, part of what they do and, and that's it. And you're like, no, you have to step out of that comfort zone and go beyond. And it, that's what we're working again. It's culture, so it's taking a long time, and it right. will. But it's it's moving people from from the from the head to the heart, and actually for it to work, and we do it, and we're we finally are doing it. Is we're trying to start with a language. If you start talking with it, you know, if you mention wirecy here, wirecy there, empowerment here, trust there, um, from the top down in that org chart, then people. You know, the troops will turn around and say, well, they keep on talking about it up there. So it must be happening. So let's try out something. And they try something little and they see it work. So they, they try something more and then they can start getting riskier and riskier. And I've seen it. It's been 18 months and I'm starting to see it. And it's, it's, it's great. It's great when you finally see that, you know, I somebody flourish. in there that starts doing it. It's amazing. And it's still going to take time. But it's so let's say, let's say there's a project in marketing. And so <clears throat> I'm envisioning where someone who's a new marketing person there through this wirekey framework is now running this project. So Ron Lovett, you're in charge of this project. So I now have to hold my team accountable for a new project, correct? I'm stepping up for the first time because it's not the tra traditional, you know, my boss isn't running this. I've So as I envision that, one of the challenges that I see is, and I love it, by the way, I'm, I'm certainly, I'd, we're very flat too. We actually don't even have, the org chart. Um, so we're even messier than that. But one of the challenges that probably I've run across doing the same thing, I'm curious if you're running across the same, is in some cases, I put people in these positions and I take for, I'll say I take for granted um, that they might not have the skills to run the project. So, so I probably have moved them too quickly into managing a team. And then they might have imposter syndrome. They might feel anxious about it. And I probably haven't slowed down and say, Hey, 
Uh, but yeah, before we do this, let me, let me just walk you through some, some management and uh, alignment tools so you can get the team on board and some accountability and, and how to communicate properly. Have you run into the same thing I have when I've tried things like that? Well, um, yes, I have. Um, in, the, in the warranty scenario, not yet, because we are still very hierarchical mentality and okay. we're trying to erase that. So for them, it's obvious that, you know, manager so-and-so is the one who's done saying it. So that, you know, you can get them into the meeting and everybody's just looking at the manager, just waiting for instructions. And I'm like, guys, um, what's happening? Right. And what I'm trying to really push is it doesn't have to, again, the leader does not mean a hierarchical leader. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I always do, for example, when I talk to my um, executive peers is like today, later on after this meeting, I have, I have a meeting with them and we're presenting our structure, the architectural structure and compensation. And I'm not presenting because I'm not the expert. It's my girl who's the expert. She's the one. Okay, I'm there. So if they start getting rough, I tell them to, you know, step back. But um, it's my girl. And, and I'm just, I'm, any questions, ask her. She, she's right. the expert. Like, another thing is, we are very used to copy me. Copy me and all the emails. Um, well, don't copy me. My inbox is disgustingly full. Please don't copy me. Unless I need to do something. And you have to tell me like a little bit what I have to do. I approve, FYI, please push, whatever. But if not, I honestly don't want to know about it. Because for me, a good business is when I don't need to do anything. That's really interesting. And so have, and, I, and it sounds like this is new, um, have, have egos come into play where someone's like, ah, but Dia, I should be running that project. I've been here. I'm more senior than you. Have you run into that? And how do you, how do you deal with that piece of it? That's, that's one of the biggest conflicts when you're dealing with this because I've earned my level. So why would so-and-so who you know, do it? And what I tend to ask them is, okay, sure, you can run it. But obviously you have this skill and this skill and the skill that he has, right? Right. Well, no, but, um, you know, I'm a manager. I'm like, fine, you take it. But I'm making you accountable for those results, not him. And, and I don't mean you go and shout to him so you can get the results. That's the only difference. I, and if so, we'll sign a contract and that will be it. So people are like, hmm, okay, well, maybe, maybe I'll think about it. I'm like, no, I'm not saying don't be part of the team. Don't be part of it because we're all part of it. What I'm saying is if you want to learn, definitely be close to him. But if you don't have those skills, be humble enough to say, I don't know. And when it comes to me, for the part that I do know, I will excel. That's working in a wirety. Yeah. And does you know it's 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 being humble. It's being it's giving trust. It's empowering people and enabling them. For me, those are the four things that play in there. But egos and levels, well, it's the hardest things. I mean, I've bumped into people who are really. I've had long two hour conversation because I changed the word of their title. Mm, is that so, yeah. They're not managed. I put the managers because I just have managers and they're like, no, right. no, no. They hired me as a senior manager. I'm like, Oh, come on. It, like, yeah, I'm not touching your salary. No, but I'm senior. And it's like, I'm like, you can put senior in LinkedIn, but, but here you're a manager. No. And two hours. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. It's it reminds very important me, for them. Years ago, I, I, one of the tests that I would have during an interview is when I would bring people in, this was so early stages when I was trying to build culture in my, my security business, which was very egotistic. There were so many males with egos in that business. And, um, and I would say, you know, so if this works out and we hire you, where would you, you know, what's important to you when it comes to an office? And I would ask that question. And it was a bait. It was, it was, I was leading the witness. And if they said, well, I'd like to be able to see outside and, you know, I need enough space. It was like, this is over. This is over. Those who said, you know, I don't care about the office. It's not important to me. I'd like to be out and, and working with people in the field. Boom. That was a big, 
that was a big bonus. That that was my trap door question, unfortunately, for people that were like, yeah. oh, thank you. Well, well, now that you asked, my office, very important. I came from a big office and uh, it's it's quite interesting. And I would say, look, I'm with you, but yeah, I hate titles. And I know it's a strong word. Hey, I just I don't, I dislike titles. And I'd rather have no titles, except for if there's pressure from the outside world. If there's pressure from the outside world, I believe that titles can be important. You know, I, if, if you're dealing with big customers and, you know, and you're dealing with a bank and they want to know they're talking to the senior vice president because it's important to them for their ego, then fine, because that's how you service your customer. But internally, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant, Absolutely. right? I change. I changed when I, when we, when we transformed our culture years ago, I changed from, from CEO to chief support officer. And I went to the bottom of the org chart, you know, I just changed okay. my title and everything. Um, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. One um, thing I've, uh, I've, I've recommended my, I know we don't use them nowadays, but when I had business cards, yeah. um, I, you know, they always have the title. I learned from very early to just put back then human resources. And people were like, yeah, but you know, but what's your title? I'm like, okay, I'm someone or you know, supervisor or whatever. And like, why don't you put it in your card? I'm like, because then if they promote me, I have to do business cards again. And that's a lot of paper wasted. So if I put just human resources, I'll be here for eternal life. No. So I, I'm actually saving the planet oh, by my it. title thing. But um, but yeah, so so they, they would ask you, so so what do you do? Okay, yes, I am the whatever it is. But I've seen titles that you crack up laughing. I had semi senior. Ooh, semi the senior. semi media in Spanish media. <laughs> no, semi senior. You also use oh. the word semi. Semi senior, okay. gerente, whatever, whatever. And I'm like, oh my god, we're in the semis now. Three quarters, nine and three quarters. I'm waiting for all those to come up. That's um, funny. I, yeah, I could care less. I honestly yeah. could care less. Yeah, but you're right. It d- does show, and it helps in with with clients. Yeah, I, yeah that's just an opinion. I've just yeah. seen that. No, it's true. It's true. It's true. So look, we've talked about all kinds of interesting stuff. Is there anything, Medea, that you think about or working on that we haven't covered that you think is worth talking about, or what's left? <clears throat> well, um. What's hot off the press at Krispy Kreme? Right now, my biggest challenge that I'm dealing with, and I'm sure if people in my area are listening, and it'll depend on each country, but this coming back to quote unquote normality to the office, if it's remote, if it's hybrid, if it's flexible, if it's, that's one of my biggest challenge right now and I think I think culture ended up being easier than this because um, you have leaders who want to have the people in the office and then you have leaders who don't mind and then you have people who don't want to come back to the office because they believe they're much more efficient um, and productive so this mix of what's the right mix and how, and then do you push them? You don't push them. Do you make them? Don't make them. It's been really, I really had this, hard. I had this debate uh, with a senior leader at CBRE. Um, okay. They're in Mexico too, just the other night at dinner. And we had, we were saying the same thing. Some leaders want it. Some leaders don't. Some people believe. And it's all like, to me, it was all ego. Like, and I know that's harsh, but my point is that, if you take away, I believe, I think, I want, that's gone. And you go to the individual results. If you actually just like, I think we just have to stop and say, okay, how's Ron Lovett doing? Is he or she producing better results? How are they doing as a team member? Let's let's just look at that person. If they're doing well, then let them work where they want. You know, so like, I, I, don't, I don't know why I don't find it that difficult. I just, I, to me, and maybe, look, there's no doubt large organizations that are global, it's a bigger problem. It's, it's, it's politics in, in these companies, you know? Um, but our, for, for, for our organizations, if you're comfortable, come to the office. If you're not, don't. If you want to come, come. If you don't, don't. But you have to deliver results. If your results go down, then it's a problem, you know? And, and that has been my argument all the time because they said to me, well, you know, and they, productivity, this, and I'm like, there's no tool, and I don't think there will ever be a tool where you can measure productivity per person. Like it, it's really hard. However, you can measure results, you know, your KPIs, your OKRs or whatever. And for me, I've seen people in the office from seven in the morning to seven at night, 
And they're in Facebook, and they are doing Instagram, and they're chit-chatting here and there. And they're not productive. Oh, but you see them there. I'm like, I'm sorry, but that doesn't mean he's committed. It means that he doesn't want to go home. That's what it means. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That's what it means. But I'm curious on this. So so my other thought, though, and my, my opinion is some company cultures... And my father-in-law has a company culture. They run a wealth management service and their company culture is you wear a tie to work. Now I might think that's silly. I don't, I haven't worn a tie in 15 years. He wouldn't, it's almost embarrassing when I go to meet with him because I don't have a tie on. It's always uncomfortable. He makes fun of me, but they, that's their culture. And so I respect that. I respect that he's saying, okay, this might be a divisive topic, but if you don't like ties, this isn't your place. And so I actually think also to coming to the office that this would be a competitive advantage or disadvantage in some cases. So, so let's say you're a, a bank and you say, I'm the leader and our culture is teamwork and this and that, but we're also, we want its collaboration face-to-face. We want you at work. I actually can get my head around that because some employees are going to say, not for me anymore. It's the great resignation. That's what they're talking about now. So they leave. Others will say, you know, I, that's what I want. I'm, I, I, I'm longing to come back and whether I get my stuff done or on Facebook all day, fine, but I want that. And so, you know, because I, I, I actually respect those who say, let me make this black and white for you. If you want to work here, you come here. If you don't, don't. I think we're going to get into that. And I think that's going to be okay too. Like I, I'm, I'm not going to judge companies that, that draw a line because I'll go back to the tie. You know, I used to kind of think it was, silly because I was projecting my own beliefs. I think a tie is silly to wear work. It doesn't change my performance, but some people might say, well, Ron, you have this unlimited vacation. And my belief is that silly. And you have, you know, performance-based culture and continuous improvement. You want people to read in your library and your silly library work, but that's our culture, you know? And so I do, I, I get it, I guess. And I'm curious in your thoughts as I'm saying that. No, absolutely. And, 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 and that's why I respect people who, when we switch from, from the holding to Krispy Kreme, they said, this is not for me. You know, I respect that. And actually, I admire that um, uh, commitment to yourself saying, you know, I have to be true to myself or what I want and where I want to be. Obviously, it wasn't a massive resignation. No, it was just a few that did it because it was pandemic. So it's not an easy thing to just say, yeah, ooh, bye, bye, goodbye. But um, for me, one thing that is important is to be coherent with your culture. So if you're saying that we trust people, that we empower people, that they're accountable, that they be like an owner, then if you're saying that, then why do you have to be in the office so I can see you? You know, right. it, it just is not coherent. Right. And we actually made it, we even had a survey where we ask people, what's your concern for coming back to work? And what's your excitement if we come back to work? Great, and sir. what we saw is that 24% of my population does not want to come back to the office at all. 24% said, I'll go back to the office, but my biggest concern is its health and, and, and what protocols you're keeping and making sure that are there because Mexico right now is not like other countries that they're a little bit, a little bit better in vaccination yeah. and all that stuff. We, we're not. And another one, and then another, and I don't remember the number now, but another big one was I still have little kids in the house. Daycares haven't opened. I have old people in the house, which I have to take care of. So if I go and expose myself, I am a risk. So they're true concerns. It's not right. just like, it's really comfortable being, you know? Mm. No, there's true concern. Yeah, yeah. So I want to be coherent. And I've told my, my, my team, you know, um, my, my peers is saying that this is the way we want to come back doesn't mean this is the way we will ever be. No, we have to be continuous evolving. Right. Hopefully this thing will eventually go away and then we will evolve to something else. And then, a trend will be coming along and it'll be something else. Agreed. I'm not saying this is a written in stone, but we have to listen and be coherent. If my culture is, I'm um, you know, face-to-face client, B2B or whatever it is, and this is then by all means, that's the way. But if I'm, you know, coming up with all this, I've been doing it for a year saying, you know, empower and trust and, that, and I'm not totally. being coherent, then it doesn't make sense. 
I, look, I agree with you. We're totally aligned on that. Well, this has been a good conversation. I'm, I, when we post this, uh, we'll certainly um, make sure we mention that we, we've had a very deep discussion about back to work and it's been helpful. Thanks. I, I yeah, like your yeah. perspective on it. Well, but yeah, look, thanks for being a guest. And I, uh, when I get to Mexico city, we will go have a Krispy Kreme. I would hope that we can do that together. And I like chocolate. That is my favorite flavor. Oh, do that. Eat. Do that. And let me know when you're coming. I'll give you all the details of where to go in the city. That sounds wonderful. I'm a big foodie too. So that sounds great. <laughs> look, <laughs> yeah. really nice to meet you. Nice uh, to meet you, Ron. I, Yes, and uh, let's keep in touch. Will do. Thank okay. you so much for having me. For more information about Badia, please connect with her on LinkedIn. For more information about our podcast or to purchase the Scaling Culture Masterclass online course, please go to scalingculture.org. And if you're enjoying the Scaling Culture podcast, please subscribe and share. We'll be back soon with another incredible guest.